There are many, many Bible stories that we have known throughout the years over the whole course of our life. Some of us can't remember when we first heard some of the Bible stories that are so interwoven into our memory. And there are aspects of those stories that are quite appropriate to childhood. And there are aspects of those stories that are very particular to adulthood. There are aspects of stories such as this one that are quite obvious. And there are some of the subtler things that we don't always think about and making connections with and even looking into our own lives. As we read our Bible, one of the things that we need to do as we sometimes refer to it as the mirror of God's Word is to continue to look at it and draw those parallels and say, what about me is like this particular story? Where, where might I be similar like in tonight's case, Balaam? What, what could I parallel up and see deeper into my soul and see some of the things that maybe God sees that I don't want to see. And so sometimes while things get so common and so familiar, the story of Balaam and the talking donkey, I mean, that's for anybody who was raised in any aspect of religion, well, that which would commonly be referred to as Christianity anyway, will know this story with such familiarity that when you come to it in Numbers 22, doing your annual Bible reading or whatever schedule you're on, you're liable just to breeze right through it and not even ponder it because it is so, so familiar. And so we're going to slow down. We're just going to look at chapter 22 tonight. We're not going to get through 24 and make some points. I don't think they'll be necessarily profound, but we're going to connect to some other verses and challenge us to look into our own hearts because if you're reading and not looking into your own heart, chances are you're missing the point of reading. Now, there is a time to study for maybe some other purposes, but the primary thing is work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, which means looking into my own heart and measuring myself by the word as I read it, and you doing the same as you read the word. And we're going to start off with the first three verses here for just a moment, make a couple observations concerning Balak, and then we'll get into Balaam. The children of Israel moved. They camped in the plains of Moab on the side of the Jordan across from Jericho. Balak, the son of Zippor, saw that all Israel had done to the Amorites, and Moab was exceedingly afraid of the people because there were many and Moab was sick with dread because of the children of Israel. Now, one of the first observations I would make here is that Balak has just kind of messed up. He is getting ready to meddle in something and he really doesn't need to meddle in. The target is Jericho. The goal is the promised land. And now he's picking a fight that, number one, he can't win, but he's picking a fight that he doesn't need to pick. I think a, a wise piece of advice is be careful. Pick your fights wisely. You know, there's a time to draw a line, and there's a time to fight, and there's a time to ignore a fight, and there's a time to walk away and just let things ride. Balak didn't quite make the right decision this time, and because of that, he and his entire country were devastated by Israel. And so one of the lessons that we make is just simply about making the right choices. When do you pick that fight? When do you not? And I wish it was all just black and white so there'd never be a mistake in the way you do it, but... You know, sometimes it's just some good wisdom, maybe some good negotiating, some good talking beforehand before the fighting starts, but that isn't the way it always works. Now, one of the points that jumps out to me is the reputation that Israel had, and it was an awesome reputation that goes all the way back to Pharaoh in those times where the plagues and the, Egypt was just devastated by the power of God. And I come up and I try to draw my parallel and I think about America today. And I think it's a sad, it's a pity, because there wasn't that horrible long ago, 50 years, maybe 60, you draw the lines where you want to draw them, but there was a time when the overall religious community, even though we disagree strongly on some doctrinal teachings, we held some moral values in common. And we stood by those moral values fairly generally. You know, there's always been an exception. We always had that little bad part of the community. But it wasn't half of the community. It wasn't 70% of the community. It was just, you know, a little portion that we'd kind of wish disappear. There was a time when the religious community had some clout. They had some ability. They had, had some backbone. When you think of the religious community now, do you think of words like backbone? Do you think of words like strength and power and influence? Or do you think of words like basketball and um, apple pie cook-offs and um, just silly fluffy stuff? Unfortunately, when you think of the broader thing now, it's more the, the fluffy stuff. But to bring it down just a tad more personal, what's your reputation? When people at work, people in your family, people dealing with you think about you and the moral lines you're going to draw, 
Do they know? We don't even need to mess with him. We don't even need to suggest that he or she go this way or that way because they're Christian and we know where they're going to stand. Or is it a fact they think they can pick and win? And see, there's one of your little parallels, just not real obvious, but nonetheless, it's a place to look. But we have that kind of reputation. And so we have Balak, not the wisest leader, but he is the king of Moab at this time, and not making the best choices. And we need to just look at ourselves sometimes and say, how are we doing on our choices? If others would talk to us and tell us what they really thought, what would they be telling us? Now, he's got a foolish plan, and his plan is to go get Balaam, and have Balaam come curse Israel on his behalf. That is verse 22 and, and verse 6. Now, the reason this is foolish is because of the proverb, there's no wisdom, there's no understanding, there's, there's no counsel against the Lord. Anytime you start making a plan and you think you're going to do an end run around God, you're an idiot. That's all there is to it. Let me just put it blunt out there so we don't have to go. I wonder what he's trying to say. Anytime you think you can do something inconsistent with Scripture and get by with it, you've got no more, Balaam's donkey's got more sense than the person who thinks they can pull a fast one on God. Now, we've got to stop and think about it, though, don't we? We've got to look at ourselves because Balaam would have never thought that of himself. Balak would have never thought that of themselves. You know, we look in the mirror, as the proverb says, every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the Spirit. And so we've got to stop and we've got to really look at these things quite close in those moments of intense, personal, private honesty when you have your moments of prayer and meditation and study wherever you set that aside so you can really ask, am I doing something so foolish as I think I'll out-talk God somehow? You see, people can out-talk people, can't they? I've seen husbands out-talk wives. I've seen people out-talk, you know, bosses. I've seen everybody out-talk somebody one way or the other. And I think it's a little misleading. And we think, well, you know, I can out-talk so-and-so and they out-talk and we can do this and we can do that and we can pull this off and we'll, we'll get by with it. Well, with people, you can. With God, you can. Remember Psalms 139 starts at verse 1. He knows our thought from afar. There's not even a word on our tongue. Behold, He knows it all together. How do you pull a fast one on God? Well, absolutely, you cannot. There is no wisdom. There is no counsel. There is no understanding against the Lord. And sometimes we need to pull back and ask her, are we pulling a Balak here on something? You know, are we doing now? Maybe I need to try to bring it in a little more. Again, this is the wrong crowd. This would be a morning point. But, you know, like attendance, you know. Sometimes we got an excuse. You know, if your ox falls into the ditch, it's okay to pull it out on the Sabbath, the old law said, but you didn't push it in to start with. Uh, and sometimes that's what our excuses are. You know, they're kind of fabricated and not the real thing. It's not big issues usually that are going to get folks like our evening crowd in trouble. It's going to be those subtle little games that we play sometimes that we think we can get by with. And we absolutely cannot get by with it any more than Balak could or Balaam could. Now, in Numbers 22, 7, they sent to Mo, the, the elders of Midian, departed with the diviner's fee in their hand, and they came to Balaam and spoke to him the words of Balak. What we have in Balaam, and because we do know the whole story, we'll get a little bit ahead, is we have a guy who's just in it for the money. He is going to take his diviner's fee. He's going to be quite excited about that, especially the second time when they gave him the raise there. But the fact is, he doesn't have Deuteronomy 6, 5 kind of attitude where he says to love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your heart. Kind of misread that, but you can see it there. He is a guy who's in it for what he can get out of it. Now, this is a little delicate. I don't exactly know how to do this because... In Romans 12, 15, he says, Weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. So we are supposed to be a community of Christians that meet together and support and care and help one another. That's absolutely part of what we do. But if a person is in it only for what they can get out of it, then they're no better off than Balaam. They're no wiser than Balaam's donkey. They are simply in it for the prophet. They are greedy like Balaam. Now again, that's a hard one to call and I, I would advise you that none of us really has the right to point the finger at another and say, well, they're just in it because they're trying to get out of it what they can get out of it. But each of us should in our private meditation, our times of prayer as we contemplate the things of the heart and the spirit should ask ourselves, are we making the mistake of Balaam? Are we in it for what we can get out of it? Are we really doing, as Deuteronomy 6, 5 quoted over Matthew 22 and 37 also, are we loving the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength? Is everything really about God? And see, that, that's real subtle because physically the activities are all going to be the same. We're going to still be singing the same songs and still be doing the same activities. 
but it's that attitude that can make or break it. So Balaam, he's a prophet of Midian, and he's doing the things that prophets of Midian did. But we know his heart certainly is not in, in the right place. And so it's a place for each of us to pause and look at. Verse 12, he got, talks to God. He tells the messenger, stay here. We'll see what the Lord has to say. God said, you shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. Now, I give you Luke eleven fifteen 15 at the bottom because they said he cast out demons by Beelzebub, above the ruler of demons. Now, the reason I chose that verse is here we have Balaam having a, for lack of a better word, a conversation with Jehovah God Almighty. He is in dialogue with God. If you read the broader context, God says, who are these people with you? He explains who they are. And God, he says, what do they want? He explains what they want. And, and so we've got some interchange. Hello, you're talking to the creator of the universe. And he says, you'll not go with them. You'll not curse them. They're blessed. Now, what does he really hear? He basically gets, I can't go. Can I? It never really soaks in. He's kind of like the Pharisees who saw the miracles and they go, yeah, but he's doing by the power of the devil. That really doesn't count. It just amazes me. Now, Balaam is even more so because it's not just that he's going to have this dialogue with God. He's going to have another dialogue with God. He's going to have a dialogue with a donkey. He's going to have a dialogue with an angel. And then he's going to go with Balak and he's going to have some more interaction with God as he's given the word of God to speak blessings upon the people of Israel and it never soaks in to the depth of his heart. He, he's got all of this interaction with God and yet his heart's never truly converted. Sound like some people you know who are traditionally involved in religion. You know, mom and grandpa was in religion. Mom and daddy was in religion. Put whatever labels you need to for your own story. Uh, you know, and, and here I am and this is just what we do. We get out of it what we can. I'm not really sure all of Balaam's story, but he never really got it, even though he was that close to it. And again, dialogue with God. I don't even know how to put that into words. Verse 13, he rose in the morning and he said to the princes, go to your land for the Lord has refused to give me permission to go with you. We're, we're kind of ahead, aren't we, a little bit. The first time he got it right. The first time he said, I can't go. Y'all go back. There's no need. The Lord has said no. Kind of like the Galatians 5, 7. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? A lot of folks do that, don't they? A lot of folks get a good start. They get up and they're, they're ready to run. They're ready to go. And Satan tries to tempt here or he tries to tempt there. And they're like, uh-uh, I'm on the straight and narrow. I'm going to heaven. And they won't turn off of it. Now, I don't think Bala Balaam was really there. But a lot of new converts are there. They have that kind of energy. They have that kind of zeal. And they're going to heaven and nobody's going to get their attention and turn it. Otherwise, they started off running well. And many of us could sit around over a cup of coffee and tell stories about how many people got that same good start. And we hadn't seen them in months or years or decades in some cases because Satan did turn their head and they did go out into the world and they are gone. And so most of us here, well, yeah, just about every one of us here got that good start. And the question would be, are we still continuing? Are we being earnest in it? Because Balak, how to, what, Balaam, excuse me, whatever you want to do with him with his proper response here, just didn't quite hold it together. So they go back, they tell Balak what's going on. Balak says, go back again. We'll send some more prestigious people. We'll up the price quite a bit. And we'll promise to honor him in any way that is imaginable. And he bites, he takes the bait. So they sent more princes and he said, well, I tell you what, stay the night. Let me check out one more time what God's going to say. Look, can you imagine David doing what Balaam did? Now, get David in perspective. Don't be thinking too much about the David and Bathsheba incident because that's not consistently David. That was a sin of David's. But David is the one that when he cut off the corner of King Saul's garment, his heart convicted him and he went out to the king and kneeled down before him and confessed the evil that he had done to the king by cutting off the corner of his garment. This is the one when somebody came to him and said, we have killed your enemy. Well, the one came and said, we killed your enemy. He said, you killed the Lord's anointed. Anointed, Your blood is upon your own head. And he had him executed. Can you imagine this David saying, well, I know God said I couldn't go. And I know God said it wasn't going to happen. And he said, these are my people. They are blessed. Well, let's go double check. Maybe he changed his mind. Can you imagine Elijah, Elisha, 
either one of those prophets playing such a trivial game with God Almighty? Samuel even. You think he would have done that? I don't know. God said you shouldn't do this. But let's go double check. Maybe he'll change his mind. That's not the way God works. And truly godly people know that. But Balaam didn't get it, did he? So he started keeping company with the wrong folks. He should have met these folks at the gate, and he should have said, guys, I already told you. God said, no. Just turn on around and get on out of here. But true to what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, evil companions corrupt good morals. And Balaam's head was turned by a little bigger price. Doesn't that happen to a lot of folks? 2 Timothy 2, 22, that's where he says, flee youthful lust, pursue righteousness, that's what Balaam should have done. And that's what we need to do. And that's what we've really got to look sometimes when, when we know Satan's been trying to get us to do whatever. You know he's not going to quit. And so he's going to up the, the intensity a little bit. He's going to up the ante. He's going to up the, the fight, the effort. What will I do? Will I do like Balaam did and play games and really be in a sense of self-denial of, of what I'm really doing? Or will I stand the ground and just say, mm -mm, no, God's already said no. We don't need to do this again. No is no. Something to think about. And so God came to Balaam at night and said to him, if the men come to call you, rise, go with them. Only the words which I speak to you, that you shall do. And I'm going to suggest to you, he never heard the, anything more than the you can go. I don't think he ever heard another thing. In Ezekiel 12, too, he said, son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house which has eyes to see but does not see, and ears to hear but does not hear, for they are a rebellious house. Balaam had eyes to see. He had ears to hear. He could have heard what God said, but his heart wasn't right. That's why the angel meets him in the way, because his heart isn't right with God. You know anybody that hears what they want to hear? You know, you can just say right out, you know, no. And they go, what do you mean? There was a country song a long time ago. It was a, a girl singing the song. This had to be 10, 15, 20 years ago. And it was, what part of no don't you understand? Was one of the lines, if not the main part of the song. Don't you know that God is sitting up there a lot of times going, what part of this do you not get? Such as let no evil communication proceed out of your mouth. Present your body a living sacrifice. Study to show yourself approved. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And you've got all of these various verses coming in and the people are just like right over their head, you know. Or as they used to say, in one ear and out the other. It never even takes time to light. It just never registers. I don't think it ever registered with Balaam. I think he heard go and that rest of it. Now, he got the rest of it in just a little bit. But I think at this point, uh, you'll only speak what I tell you to speak. I don't think it ever, ever entered his conscious contemplation whatsoever. Verse 22. Then God's anger was aroused because he went. And the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way and as, as an adverse adversary against him. And he was riding on his donkey. And his two servants were with him. Now, we never make comment on them much, and I'm not going to really now. But I kind of wonder what they thought. You think they saw the angel, or they think they saw Balaam kind of talking to air? Uh, don't know how that worked out, but it's a curious point. Here we got Balaam. God has said to him the first time, you're not going, you're not cursing. These are my blessed people. And he did the right thing the first time. He said, okay, y'all go back. They come back. They up the ante. They say, we're going to pay you a whole lot more. God says, you can go, but you're only going to speak what I tell you. Obviously, his heart's not right. He only hears the go. I'm going to make some money. And he makes the go for it. And now he's angered the Lord. Hebrews 10, 30 and 31. We know him who said, vengeance is mine. I will repay says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That's where Balaam was going. He was falling into the hands of the living God. That, you, you just have to look at it and go, how, how can you be that dense ever? And then you go, oh, Romans 3.23, huh? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then we have 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our trespass, He's just, will, just and faithful to forgive us our trespass because sometimes we're just as dense as Balaam now and then. We hear the part of the word that we want to hear and the rest never really registers until something happens, if we're fortunate enough, that just grabs our attention and forces us to look it square in the face and say, hey, look at what you're doing here. And then we go, oh, wait a minute. And then if we're truly penitent, we'll back off and do the right thing. But Balaam, again, he's falling into the vengeance of God, which all sinners do. 
and it's a time, time to stop and contemplate. What, what am I not seeing in God's Word regarding my life that I ought to be seeing? Now, unless you're willing to advocate that you have reached total perfection and total absolute maturity, then all of us still have some polishing and working to go on. Now, I hope that you're way past, you know, vulgar language and going out on Friday night and getting drunk and gambling and womanizing. I hope all of that's such far history back that you, you know, don't even remember it anymore. But there are subtler attitudes of the heart that we always have to look at and things that can happen. Things, you know, where we hate, have jealousies, are uh, covetous, just, you know, envious, and, you know, they're just those little things that don't show up on the surface like going out and womanizing on Friday night, but uh, they're there and God sees them. We've got to look at those because if we continue in them, God will get his vengeance. Verse 23, the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his sword drawn in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. So Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back into the road. And then I'll give you 1 Corinthians 1 27 here. Because God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God's chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. Now, I'm on speculative ground here, and we all would be, but I've always wondered okay, the donkey's talking now, you know, in this particular part of the context. What, what do you do when an animal starts talking to you like we talk to one another? And I'm kind of thinking, you know, I wonder if 1 Corinthians 1.27 gives us a little more insight because in that culture, number one, human was, is the top of God's creation. We are the, the crowning achievement of this whole physical thing. He did put us in charge over the world. And then, of course, man, sorry, ladies, but man is over woman. That's the way God set it up. And, and then, of course... He's a prophet, so he's got some idea of his own worth within the community, and, and King Balak is uh, hiring him to do it. I, I get an idea sometimes that, that maybe he was indignant. How dare a donkey try to admonish me and tell me what to do? I am Balaam. I am the prophet. Balak has hired me, and a donkey is going to correct me? I wonder if he wasn't indignant and just really taken aback at the avenue God used to get his attention. Out of the mouth of babes, you find truth. You know, sometimes we get ourselves in situations that we get crossways, and sometimes the avenue through which the truth is spoken to us when somebody says, hey, don't you think you ought to reconsider this or that? Sometimes it's just if you'll allow the phrase, it's the wrong person, and it, we bow up. Our dander gets up. How dare that punk, that kid, that still wet behind the ears, try to tell me how I ought to be living my life, you know? Or that scoundrel, I know things they did. How dare that? You know, we can do that, can't we? We can be just like Balaam. We've got God talking through us through somebody in a manner of speaking. And yet, because it's the foolish things of the world and our pride is stirred up, we never hear the message that we really need to hear. And we persist in our stupidity until one day we find out that our God is a consuming fire and that it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You know, that, that pride thing. Now, again, I'm a little speculative grand because I don't know exactly what Balaam's response was at the donkey talking. I think myself I'd have passed out. But here he is arguing with the donkey. It's just phenomenal. He's arguing with another demonstration of the power of God. Now, if I'm counting right, this is the third one. First time the messengers came, he had a dialogue with God. Second time the messengers came, he had a dialogue with God. Now he's got a donkey talking to him, which never ever happens in any place I've ever been. So I think you need to go, okay, this is God trying to tell me something again. And he's still not getting it. The Lord opened the mouth of the donkey and the donkey said, what have I done to you? And again, all these signs and Balaam is just oblivious to the truth. Now, you go, yeah, but he's got signs, right? How many of us profess to believe that this is the inspired Word of God? That really God Himself, that men wrote as they were carried on by the Spirit to write. That this is, in essence, the finger of God delivered through men, inspired men, and that everything in court recorded in this is accurate. And it's true, and it really happened. The donkey really did talk. The Red Sea really did part. God really did come down on Mount Sinai and all of those things. We got a lot of signs too, don't we? 
Well, I admit I've never had a dog talk to me, never had a cat talk to me, nor a donkey. You know, I haven't seen the signs that directly, but I've got the living word of God that's sharper than a two-edged sword, dividing the, between joint and marrow, soul and spirit. Pretty much a sign, if you want to ask me. Now, I realize it doesn't qualify in the same miraculous way as we're talking about here, but what more do I need other than the written word of God? And yet, sometimes we got it all laid out in front of us, and for reasons that probably some of the best psychologists could not explain, it never gets through, and we never really see it. And when that becomes the case, we usually end up destroyed, like Balaam eventually did. So the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with a sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed his head and fell on flat on his face. Now, if I didn't pass out at the donkey talking to me, I'll guarantee you Clarence is gone now. Now, you can think you stood up and stalked him if you want, but I just don't have that much courage myself. And yet, he's got all of this, and it still doesn't register, does it? I gave you Luke 16. This is out of the story of the rich man and Lazarus, where says, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rises from the dead. And there are people that way. Isn't that, that phenomenal? There are people that literally, if someone came back from the dead and talked to them, they would not truly repent and do what they're supposed to do. One biblical example of that is King Saul when he went to the witch of Endor. And who came up and talked to him and said, tomorrow you're dead? Oh, okay. Even though one comes back from the dead... They're still not going to believe it. you got God himself talking to us through his written word, and yet many times we can be like Balaam, especially when, as when something gets under our saddle. You know, you get a little burr under your saddle, something gets under your skin. It doesn't have to be a great big thing. It just gets something that we say rubs us the wrong way, and all of a sudden we can be just as blind and and resistant as Balaam was all the way through. Isn't that amazing? Now, we're going to deny it, obviously, the same way Balaam would deny it, but we do it. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know you stood in the way against me. Now, therefore, if it displeases you, I'll turn back. Well, yes. I know. Matthew 15, 8, the people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts far from him. Balaam was not truly penitent. He, he didn't care. Look, Balaam was saving his own skin here. That's all Balaam's doing. You got an angel. He's got a sword drawn. What are you going to say? Let me go back to my donkey and get my sword. We'll just fight this out, right? Not me. If I'm cognizant anyway, I'm going to say the same thing Balaam did. I'm going home. No, no, I don't need to go on over there. Balaam can take care of this thing himself. But his heart was never in it. He just said the things that needed to be said because it was the way to save his skin. How many times do we, when we get caught with our hand in a cookie jar, say the thing that needs to be said, but never really at the depth of our heart where the turning really happens, truly repent and say, and I mean in the depth of that heart, those secret places if you would, I'm never going to do that sin again. Because like Joseph, when he said, how could I do this horrible thing against God when he was rejecting Potiphar's wife? There's the attitude. That's where we aim. And so as we read the story of Balaam and we think about these things and, and we try to draw parallels, and they're not always going to be really clear, but we look at him and his insincere repentance and we say... Am I insincere sometimes? Am I really not doing what... I'm saying the right words. I know how to say that. I got Christianese down pretty good. But is it really in the depth and the core of my heart? Now, unfortunately, it wasn't for Balaam. And so as the story winds up, and that gets us to the end of chapter 22, essentially, he went on. He did not say anything that he wasn't supposed to say. I wouldn't either, not because he had such respect and loyalty for God. It's because he was scared to death, and he knew he'd die if he did anything out of the way. So he did what he was told to do and then we're going to see one more verse he was still a scoundrel first off it was the greed in his heart all along he says for they've taken the way and gone astray following at the way of Balaam the son of Beor who loved the wages of unrighteousness and that's what happens to a whole lot of folks they love the wages of unrighteousness it doesn't have to be gold and silver it can be anything that takes one away from God and sometimes in some cases it can be something that is not sin in and of itself but it still takes us away from God and we have to have the self honesty the brutality of self to really look at those things and be sure that we're not guilty of some split loyalties Woe well, to them, for they've gone the way of Cain. They've run greedily in the air of Balaam for a prophet. 
and perished in the rebellion of Korah. And again, you look at yourself. But here's one of the more telling things about Balaam as we bring it to a close. Is that these few things I have against you because there are those who hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak. Now, who taught Balak? Balaam taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Now, we're going to stop here and say, you know, he was never wiser than his own donkey. But as you think about that verse, he had a dialogue with God the first time the messenger came. He had a dialogue with God the second time the messengers came. He's got his donkey talking to him. I want to wake you up. He's got an angel talking to him. That's the fourth one. Then he goes to make the uh, sacrifices, and God, of course, pronounces blessings through him. What, four different occasions he prophesies, and he realizes that God is pleased that he doesn't even try to manipulate things anymore. So we've got something like eight or nine times he has very intimate interaction with God, the divine, and the miraculous. And after it's all over, he says, well, and I'm paraphrasing wildly here, but he says, well, Balak, I'm sorry. I couldn't bring that curse down on you, but let me show you how to put a stumbling block in front of Israel and have them offer things to idols and get involved in sexual immorality. It never dented him. It never made an impression on him, and yet he was that that close to God all the way along. Now, application. Are we smarter than Balaam? Are we smarter than his donkey? We've got things from God that we call the Word of God living sharper than a two-edged sword. Is it making an impression? Is it getting deep? Now, I know on the surface, absolutely, all of us here are good folks. In those private places of the heart where only God sees and only you can see, is it getting down there? If it is, stay the course. You're on the way. If it's not, it's time to make your body a living sacrifice. Most likely that's private, which is fine. You just keep working on those private things and force yourself on. If there is something public that you need to address, then we're here to help.